Everybody wants world peace, right? Now, you may think that it'll come with UN humanitarian efforts or something similar to that thing, but let this sink in for a second. A language was once proposed as a means to quite a little piece. This language happened to be Esperanto, which I'm going to be talking about today. Now, what is Esperanto? It's an artificial language created by Dr. L. L. Zamenhof, and it's based on many different European languages. The sound inventory is based on Slavic languages, and the vocabulary is based on Romance languages. And it's the most commonly spoken artificial language worldwide. It's spoken mostly in urban areas where people form Esperanto clubs, and it's extremely popular on the internet where there are various message boards and subreddits dedicated to the study and speaking of Esperanto. There are more than 2 million speakers worldwide, especially 2,000 or so native speakers, this being their first language. It's so popular, in fact, that it's even got its own flag. Um, the majority of the flag is green in order to symbolize the hope for Esperanto to reach its goal, and it's also symbolic of Esperanto's roots, its heritage. Many of the publications of Dr. Zamenhof were published in a green, uh, green cover, so they were just a flag was adapted to model Dr. Zamenhof's works. The white is to symbolize peace, the peace that Esperanto is to bring, and the five-pointed star is to symbolize the five continents as to where Esperanto would spread. Now, who is Dr. Zamenhof? Dr. Zamenhof was a Jewish ophthalmologist born in Bialystok, Poland, a city of much cultural diversity, but also cultural misunderstandings. Um, I mean, you had Polish people, native Poles, you had people emigrating from Turkey, people emigrating from France, from Germany, uh, you had many different religions, many different languages being spoken, and this led to many cultural and language misunderstandings, language barriers. At the age of 19, on July 26, 1887, he published Un Juan Libro, the first publication of Esperanto. And he published it under the name Doctor Esperanto, which is where it derives its name. Previously, Esperanto was referred to as the international language, but Esperanto means the one who hopes. So Zamenhof thought it fit to retitle the international language Esperanto. Now, Dr. Zamenhof was motivated to do this because in this city, like I said before, people were not only separated by geographical boundaries, but also cultural and language barriers. And because of this and the subsequent cultural misunderstandings, he believed that a language that unified everyone would alleviate any potential conflicts. He also believed that it would enable everybody, from farmers and peasants to politicians, to engage in meaningful discussions. And it was also a sense of his identity that prompted the creation of Esperanto. He once said, My Jewishness has been the main reason why, from earliest childhood, I gave myself completely to one crucial idea, the dream of the unity of humanity. And he said this because of the anti-Semitism of the other stuff. Now, what exactly is Esperanto? Um, it's a language based on our Latin scripts, similar to English and Spanish and French. It, however, omits the letters Q, W, X, and Y in favor of C, G, H, J, and S with a certain flag accent, as you can see here and here. And U with a breath, as you can see here. This is to alter the pronunciation of the letters, so that way it's easier for people to learn. Which brings me to my next point, that Esperanto is one sound to one letter. So, that means that every word will have exactly one pronunciation. You won't have to really memorize whether or not a certain word should be said as, for instance, contract or contract. Now, here's some key vocab for Esperanto. Hello is salutong. Goodbye is adieu. Thank you is dangpong. And the specific symbolism of dragons in China is Now notice 
how much of what I said is to a degree similar to Roman languages, such as Tancum, uh, Adieu being based on French and Spanish written by Adios or Adieu, and Tancum being based on German for thank you, which is Danke. And this might sound really intimidating, but get this, Esperanto is four times easier to learn than any other language. And it's easy to understand if you're fluent in Spanish or German, as I can show you in this video here. But how universal is Esperanto? Will native French, German, and Spanish speakers be able to understand some choice phrases? Let's find out. Mi asilo havas hamstro. La hamstro no mi just fred. Your son has a hamster? Yes. And its name is Fred. What did you pick out of it? It looks like French and English. Or Spanish. And Spanish also, yeah. yeah. Mi apatro havas hundo. La hundo no mi just rocks. Well, it's got a dog. He has, okay. How do you do that? I don't know. It just sounds like a lot of words, yeah. And European languages. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of point, right? <laughs> I know it's from German because I'm a spirit and a German speaker and German it's hund. Hund, okay. So, the theory works surprisingly well. And here's a little bit more on the linguistic characteristics of this book. The words and the vocabulary are basically roots and grammatical endings stuck together with any appropriate prefixes or suffixes added later. And this makes Esperanto easy to learn because this rule will hold true for almost every single word, meaning that whenever you're blanking out on the word, you can just remember this rule, remember the roots, and then the word comes easy. And the vocab and syntax in Esperanto are mixtures of romance and Germanic languages, syntax being romance, phonetics being Slavic, and vocab being two thirds romance and one third Germanic, like we saw in the video. Now, how similar is Esperanto to different artificial languages? I'm going to be talking about two in particular Loiban and Interlingua. Let's start with Interlingua. Um, Interlingua is a language that was created in a similar vein to Esperanto. It was able to aid Europeans in uniting them in a common language because this was based on Latin, which is the root of many of Rome, many Romance languages, the majority of which are spoken in Europe. All of which is that. Esperanto and Interlingua are similar because they contain similar grammar and vocab structures. They had somewhat similar motivations for creation. However, Esperanto's main roots are in the Romance languages themselves, whereas Interlingua, as I said before, is based on Latin. Now, Loibon is a different story. Esperanto and Loibon are similar in the sense that both help with alleviating miscommunications. Esperanto being an easy language many Europeans could learn and understand, and Loibon being a syntactically unambiguous language, meaning that language is very direct, every sentence has one possible interpretation, meaning there's no confusion. However, Esperanto is much easier to learn, and it was designed to generate world peace by alleviating miscommunications, whereas Loibon was just created to satisfy many linguistic theories that now actually helps with the uh, artificial intelligence sector. Why does this matter? Obviously, everything has its limits, and adopting Esperanto is no different. And you might be thinking, why does an artificial language matter? I mean, we've already got English, we've already got all these other languages, why do we have to institute them? Let me go through with some of the limitations of adopting Esperanto as a universal language. Right now, it's hard to find places where it'll actually serve use. Despite having, you know, two million speakers worldwide, it still isn't that popular. If you can dedicate the time to go onto online message boards and Esperanto speaking clubs, then that's good. But other than that, not many opportunities are there in practice. There aren't many opportunities to you know, apply other than Esperanto literature or films. Also, there isn't much of a culture with Esperanto. There have only been a handful of novels, as I said before, in Esperanto and just four movies. If I need just a means of caring culture, then Esperanto surely doesn't do the job. Language is also identity. Because the human race is so culturally diverse, and since language is a vessel of this culture, having a universal language would be detrimental to the development and expression of this culture, and people don't work by conforming to one single form. It's not how people work. 
things also change. Language is, has a genuine tendency to change. And we see this with Latin turning into many Romance languages that are spoken around the world. Old English turning into the English we speak today. And the many forms of slang that appear all across the world. My understanding is we can assume that one universal language will eventually diverge into many different dialects, thus not achieving its potential intentions of uniting the whole world, which is one language in one. And finally, it can be hard to convince people to learn Esperanto in order to fulfill its goal of uniting the world. Yes, it's relatively unpopular. It's very small. People aren't familiar with it. So getting people to learn this is going to be very hard because they're not familiar with it. But, I mean, it shouldn't be that big of a problem because the bulk of Esperanto speakers live in urban sprawls all across Europe, East Asia, East Coast of the United States, etc. There are some benefits to Esperanto. You could say that it's utterly useless to learn an artificial language. It just doesn't have any use at all. It's stupid. You don't want to learn. But it's actually been proven to help people learn languages easier. Studies have shown that students who learn Esperanto as a second language learn a third and a fourth language more easily and more quickly than if they learned a separate language. This is commonly referred to as a spring language. And this is important because in our time, the demand for learning the English language has never been higher, especially people nowadays are learning English in places where English is not only not the dominant language, but the dominant language is on a completely different solar system from English. So having people learn Esperanto before or in addition to English can alleviate some of the difficulties. It's also relatively simple to learn. There aren't any irregular verbs with Esperanto because the one rule of being conjugation rules apply everywhere. The one rule about one sound to one letter is applicable to the entire language. So that means it's easy for people to speak, and Adam, you can speak off the top of your mind with not even much experience with somebody who has a lot of experience and you can carry on a conversation just fine. And because it's not spoken by an entire country or by a political group, it's very politically unbiased, meaning that it will prevent any more political group or party from getting any sort of political advantage. Language is a part of culture and tradition, but miscommunications will cause conflicts. Adopting Esperanto is not a costless solution, but we should take time to consider the benefits. And already there are some benefits right now. Esperanto is now being instituted in primary schools all across Great Britain and some parts of Europe. People are teaching Esperanto to their kids as a means of preparing them for learning other languages in the future. And Esperanto may not exactly break all the barriers, but I think it's a step in the right direction to getting them done. Hopefully in the future there will be a time where Esperanto is going to achieve. Hope may not be the primary language of the world, but the fact that it's easy to learn and it can help other people learn languages may be the driving force of learning. Thank you very much for your time.